Right. So we've been kind of uh, backward engineering the uh, the Jewish feasts, right? Uh, our Jewish friends uh, celebrate these feasts. They remember these feasts. Most of them don't even know uh, why they do it. You know, uh, these things have been around for 3,000, 3,500 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a tradition, you know, more than anything else. But what we've been doing is, is looking at uh, some of the spiritual meanings in them and how they relate to Christ. So, you know, unlike a Jew and how they would look at the uh, feast, we've been trying to see Christ in the Jewish feast. So we've looked at four so far. Passover, which is Pesach in uh, Hebrew. And uh, Passover celebrates the uh, deliverance. Right? The, uh, the deliverance of the people from Egypt, where the angel came and the, the past angel of death passed over the Jewish homes and they were able to escape out of Egypt. We looked at the, uh, the Feast of Weeks, Shabbat, which is uh, referred to in the New Testament as the Day of Pentecost. So we're kind of familiar with that one. It's the day uh, traditionally understood when God gave the law to Moses. And it's about um, laws and obedience and following God. We looked at Rosh Hashanah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, which begins the High Holy Days. Uh, it's the Jewish New Year, right? The first day of the year. And it follows by a 10-day period of, uh, of celebration. And on the first day, they remember all of the sins. They think about all of the things they've done wrong over the past year. And on the 10th day, you've got Sukkah, the, uh, or Yom Kippur, the uh, Day of Atonement. So on the 10th day is when you make atonement for all the sins that you've committed. So it's a, it's a process of remembering what you've done wrong and atoning for that. So today we're going to talk about Sukkah. The Feast of Tabernacles, which happens five days after that, on the 15th of the month. Let's take a look at the reading. We'll go back to this uh, section in Leviticus chapter 23 and see where these the Feast of Tabernacles began uh, in the Old Testament. So we've been reading, we read the whole chapter now, so far we're on uh, verse 33 of Leviticus 23. And we see that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and for seven days, is the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. Verse 37. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation, for presenting the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free offerings which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. You shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this is uh, a this is one of the funner ones, right? This is the this one is it's a celebration. It's all supposed to be rejoicing and happiness. 
uh, they, they build these uh, little tents, these little tabernacles or booths out of uh, branches from palm trees and branches from the fruit trees. Typically, you build them on the roof of your house, and you would go out and you remember the Lord for seven days, rejoicing in the Lord. So the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, it's the, the last of three different pilgrimage festivals, right? So there's three times a year that the Jews were commanded to go up to Jerusalem. So they had to go to the spiritual center, the, the capital of the country, three times a year. First on Passover, and then on Pentecost, and then on the Feast of of tabernacles. So just like the Passover and the Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles had all kinds of significance to the Jewish person. It had historical significance, religious significance, and agricultural significance. So Passover, remember I said Passover commemorates the deliverance of the Hebrew slaves from Egypt, and it marks the beginning of the barley harvest. Pentecost, Pentecost, uh, commemorates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and it marks the harvest of the first fruits. And this uh, feast here, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, commemorates the 40 years of wandering in the desert, and it marks the final harvest of the agricultural year. So they built these tents, these tabernacles, out of branches, and they lived in those for seven days to remember the fact that that their people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So let's look a bit about what it is to uh, celebrate Sukkoth with, uh, you know, as a Jew uh, today. So like Passover, Sukkoth is observed for an entire week. So it begins with a Sabbath and it ends with a Sabbath. It begins with a sacred assembly, you know, followed by seven days of feasting, and it ends on the eighth day with another sacred assembly, another Sabbath. But unlike the Passover, which we're familiar with, Sukkah is observed as a purely uh, time of joy. It's a joyous time. It's a time of celebration. You don't focus on any of the harsh memories of, of slavery or the death of the fourth, firstborn. You don't focus on all the sins that you've committed. Sukkoth is uh, a time to rejoice. It's a direct biblical commandment. We just saw it there in um, you know, verse uh, 40, 40, right? You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So it's interesting. It carries this, this commandment of God to be happy carries as much weight as the commandment to fast. On Yom Kippur. So, to a Jew, not to be joyous during Sukkoth is a, is a, is to, is to commit the sin of rebellion. Right? You're you're not obeying what God says, and you're not being joyous. So, Sukkoth begins on the fifteenth of the seventh month, um, and it goes for seven days to the twenty second. So, it comes right on the heels of of Yom Kippur. You know, which is a very solemn, uh, reverent time. So you can you can kind of see the uh, the emotions they would go through, where they had this solemn, reverent time of of remembering what you've done wrong, of, of atoning for your sins, and it's followed up by this kind of really abrupt about face, and we turn around from being solemn to being, you know, full of uh, fun and rejoicing. So one week, everyone is fasting and repenting and, uh, you know, living in fear and trembling of the Lord. And the next week, they're all laughing and feasting. So they literally go from fasting to feasting. And at first glance, it kind of seemed kind of odd, kind of incongruous. Why would they do that? But in fact, the two are, are related together. The celebration is closely linked with the fasting. And it's because of the Day of Atonement. Right? Sins have been forgiven. God has been gracious. The harvest has been gathered in. Uh, and uh, you know, God cares for us. He's watching out for us. 
So clearly a celebration is in order. So it's, it's a, a note to ourselves that we're not to live a whole life of uh, uh, depression and sadness because once our sins are forgiven, it's time to celebrate. And this celebration in, in Israel takes a specific form. The people are commanded to observe, observe a number of rituals during the week of, of, of Sukkah. First and foremost is this booths. They're to build these tabernacles and live in these tabernacles for seven full days, for seven nights. Now, don't confuse these tents with the tent of meeting, right? The tabernacle, the big tabernacle where sacrifices were made to the Lord. These things aren't uh, fancy. They're not uh, glorious or covered in gold. These are simple, temporary dwellings. The whole purpose was to remind them that it was temporary, that the, the suffering is temporary and the joy is much, much greater. So the, the rabbis had all kinds of traditions in building the booths. Uh, and, and mainly, they were supposed to be very flimsy, supposed to be very temporary. Um, the roofs uh, were made of branches uh, or just uh, reeds uh, you know, pulled out of the ground laid loosely enough so you could see the stars. Rabbis would say when you lay in your, in your booth at night, you should be able to see the stars through your roof. Just to kind of bring you know, home this idea that it's not permanent, that this isn't our permanent dwelling. So in addition to living in the booths, the people are commanded to uh, take the best fruit from the trees and, and rejoice before the Lord for seven days. So it was... It was a time of, you know, that, that kind of like we're coming up on Thanksgiving, that, that time of harvest, uh, of just being thankful, of playing games, of having fun, of being with your family. The tradition of the rabbis uh, says that the fruit uh, had to include a citrus, and the fronds uh, had to include uh, at least one palm branch. So... They had a palm branch, they had a willow, and they had a, a, a myrtle. And those are the, you know, the, the, in the, in the uh, traditional Hebrew, uh, to the elders, those are referred to as the four species. You had the citrus, the palm, the myrtle, and the willow. And there's, there's all kinds of instructions, you know, because this is how the rabbis think. There's all kinds of instructions about, you know, how you build this and and, and what you did with each branch, and how you held each branch, and how you you uh, you waved the branches, uh, you know, when you said the prayers, building the uh, the booth. So just as the prayers said on Yom Kippur um, were supposed to be communal in nature, you know, we said we have sinned, not I have sinned. So the praises, the the thanksgivings that you pray on Sukkah are also communal. In nature. So it's all about being together and we are thankful. You know, we have been blessed by God. Everybody who's participating in Sukkah is commanded to uh, invite some strangers into their booth to share meals and to rejoice with them. So you would go out and you would find someone to have this meal with. You got some fresh fruit. You got this booth that you built. Let's sit here in the shade and let's eat this, right? It was a week long festival of, of shared meals. Uh, friends and relatives coming together, everyone, you know, giving kind of reciprocal invitations. You come over to my house on Tuesday, I come to your house on Wednesday, and they would each, you know, go into different booths and, and share these, uh, these meals, these feasts. There'd be a lot of time for laughing. And they're communal in nature, right? The whole community would get together and they would share in reciting these prayers, these praises, these prayers to God. The word... The Hebrew word hallelujah is, that's a community word, right? It means everyone prays the Lord together. So it's not just, it was not just about you individually, you know, being uh, uh, alone somewhere praising God. It's about us getting together and hallelujah, we would all praise God together. So this idea that the praise and the rejoicing and the thanksgiving are by their nature community activities that's key to understanding this Feast of the Tabernacles. It wasn't a private time. The, the, the Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Kippur, 
much more private things where you're thinking about yourself, about your sins, about your position for God, what you have done, what you need to be atoned for. The, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths, is a time for us to get together and to rejoice. Uh, there's an um, old Hebrew saying that says, if I rejoice by myself, I experience a measure of joy. But if you rejoice with me, my joy is increased. And that's kind of true for us, too, in our lives. You know, when, when, you're, when you're happy, you want to share that with someone. You want to be with somebody and not just be all alone and, and be happy. You know, you want to get together with people and, and uh, talk about the good that you've been blessed with and what you've been enjoyed. So imagine when an entire faithful community comes together and rejoices at once. That experience then is exponential. You know, it's a, it, you know, imagine, like, like on Thanksgiving Day, it, back when we were younger, you know, before Walmart started opening up on Thanksgiving Day and everyone goes shopping, you know, it was a time when nothing was open. And if you, if you went out in the neighborhood and walked around, it was just, everybody was out. The kids were throwing the football and, and the whole community was enjoying this day off. This is the, what you experienced uh, in Judaism for the whole week. So a key component then is this um, temporary nature of the booths. To, to evoke this uh, nomadic dwellings of the 40 years. Remember, they wandered around in the promised land before they went, you know, before they went in. They wandered around the, in the desert before they went into the promised land for 40 years. And we're supposed to, the, uh, the Feast of the Booths is supposed to uh, evoke that same kind of feeling, remind us of this uh, transitory nature of our, of our time here on earth. The, the Sabbath Booths are fragile, just like our bodies are fragile, right? You, uh, you, you might think um, your body is strong, but as you get older, you, know, you realize you know, how, how uh, weak uh, and, and fragile a body is. As the Hebrews in the desert were just passing through on their way to a better place, we too are not really inhabitants of this world. We're just passing through on our way to the world to come. So we're on our way home, and our temporary dwellings of flesh should serve to remind us of that fact. So this uh, unsettled, fragile component of the sukkah dwelling, it lends a kind of a poignant note to the feast and the celebrations, right? Um, if you're eating this fresh fruit and, and you're kind of aware of how fragile and how temporary things are and how you may not even be here very much longer, then that fruit tastes that much sweeter. You enjoy it that much more. So part of that lesson is to enjoy this fleeting moment while it lasts. You know, rejoice while we're together in this uh, in this temporary structure, because soon it's all going to come apart again. Traditionally, they would read Ecclesiastes during this week. And Ecclesiastes carries that same theme of, of the transient nature of life. Over and over, Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says that everything is vanity. Everything is vain. Everything, nothing really lasts. And his point is, now is the time to praise the Lord. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't be thinking about tomorrow. So those are the three things I want to you know, make sure we're clear on tonight. The three eternal principles, these three spiritual lessons that we get from the Sukkah. First one is that forgiveness requires thanksgiving. When you realize you've been forgiven by God, you have to be thankful for that. We need to live a life of, of thankfulness because we've been forgiven. Number one, forgiveness requires thanksgiving. And number two is together we worship. That worship isn't intended to be something you do all on your own. Worship is intended to be something you do together with people. It's a community event. And number three, we're just passing through. This is all, all temporary. So let's talk about this idea of forgiveness requiring thankfulness. There's a, there's a good uh, lesson for us from Exodus. Take a look at Exodus uh, 16. We got the, uh, 
that this is the generation that, that just left Egypt and they're wandering around in, in the wilderness. Right? So this generation is kind of famous for being uh, a grumbling you know, people. Moses says in verse 9, Say to the whole congregation of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. So the people were were just famous. Look at you know, look what's going on here in this in this chapter. Um, they they complained because they didn't have anything to eat, and God gave them manna. They they complained because they got sick of the manna. You know, we can't eat this bread all the time. Give us something else. So verse thirteen, quail comes up from the ground. So quail is like a, a game bird. You know, beautiful eating uh, bird. And they ate that, and then they got sick of that. You know, and they complained about that. Uh, and it just goes on and on. And, um, you know, God gets, you know, frustrated with them. And uh, what verse am I looking at? Like, um, yeah, look at verse 35. The people of Israel ate the, the manna 40 years till they came to the habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So these people were these people were thankless for the most part. Yet God not only forgave their sins time and time again, but He also provided for their needs. He gave them manna. He gave them quail. In fact, even though their lack of faith kept them out of uh, the promised land, God nevertheless provided them with uh, the food and clothing and shoes and everything for their whole lives as they wandered around in the wilderness, living in these booths, right? Living in these tents. Look at, in chapter 16, look at verse like uh, 23. God says, Tomorrow is the day of solemn rest, the holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil. So they laid aside in the morning as Moses had commanded, and they did not stink, and there was no worms. So God cared about enough for the people that they actually made a special provision on the Sabbath, so they didn't have to work. They didn't have to even go out and gather the manna because every day the manna would rot by the next morning, but not on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, it would stay fresh right straight through till Sunday. I mean, it's just amazing how God took such special care of them and wanted them to be able to celebrate the Sabbath. So God's attitude toward Israel is one that, although he didn't, you know, didn't accept their sin, he would nonetheless, he would make allowances for their weaknesses. He realized that they were human. The Bible refers to them, if you think about it, the Bible refers to them as the children of Israel. Over and over again, they're the children of Israel. Uh, kind of talking about their lack of maturity, you know, and how God just saw them as young children. Imagine how things would have been different if the children of Israel had reacted positively to God's provision. You know, the only reason we work, the only reason we get up and go to work is because we have to buy food, we have to buy groceries. Well, what if God just provided it for you? So if they had been thankful and, and lived their life of praise as opposed to complaining about it and being and grumbling, imagine how things would have been different. If God forgave their stiff-necked rebellion and blessed them in spite of their sin, how much more would they have been blessed if they'd been obedient and thankful? So it kind of makes me think sometimes of me. You know, how often are we guilty of the same kind of sin? You know, God blesses us with so much, and yet we still grumble. We, you know, we say He's unfair. You know, we say we didn't, you know, we didn't get what we wanted. Uh, when when we uh, when we do that, we're acting just like them. It's you know God has given us so much, and yet we still complain about it. When we don't hear from God for what seems like a long time, we start to credit the idols with our salvation. We think that it's our our four hundred one k savings plan that's going to provide for us, or it's our college degree that's rescued us, or our hard work and perseverance that's got us through. Instead of Realizing it's God that's blessed us with these things, we 
kind of think of ourselves that we did it for ourselves. So the first lesson is to remember to give thanks to God. Forgiveness requires thankfulness. Thank God for providing everything, the very air that we breathe. Thank God for tolerating our, our childish rebellion and blessing us almost in spite of ourselves. We need to thank God for this incredible, beautiful world that we live in, we live in and give him praise for, for the life that we have. You know, God is patient and he's loving and he's forgiving. And we're not to take that for granted. We're to be thankful for that. So, lesson number two then. Um, that we're, you know, to, we're supposed to worship together. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. We see a bit about this, um, this day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. So, Peter gets up and he, and he gives them this um, real strong sermon. And in verse 41, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their, their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Look at this, this just awesome response to the preaching of Peter. I mean, Peter gave a pretty astonishing sermon that day. You know, he stood up there and really amazed people and convicted people. And he, he got the, the uh, early church you know, really off to a good foot. Food. But the response was amazing. Not only did 3,000 people get baptized in that same day, but they went out and they sold their possessions and they divided their money up and they, they shared each other. And they lived in this true spirit of brotherly love. The, uh, many of the letters in the New Testament deal with arguments and divisions and problems among the church. It tells them to settle their divisions in love. But it started off on a good note. You know, it started off with a, with a really positive thing. Nowhere did we read that the apostles walked away from fellowship with each other or, or gave up on each other because of their personality conflicts or, or any kind of clashes. They didn't say, well, it's just not worth it. I'm going to go off on my own and do this on my own. They stuck together. Because together is how we can worship God in spirit and in truth. If we, we, we can't do it on our own. The opposite is the case. Always you find the message of reconciliation and, and, and fellowship. Uh, tradition holds that John, in the last days of his life, would say over and over to those that came to hear his teaching, little children love one another. And that's the same thing we need to remember today. There's, you know, there's a tendency for people to want to just kind of go off and be on their own and, and serve God their own way, you know. But it's important for us to be together in a group. And, and that's how the Bible teaches us how God wants to be worshipped. He wants to be uh, worshipped together in, in one community. So there is um, an open-hearted attempt uh, to, to honestly uh, talk about your problems and resolve things will keep that group together. There's a great uh, verse I like in Romans chapter 12 that says, If at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's kind of the, the summary of the New Testament is you know, we're supposed to. God wants us to learn from the experience of living together, 
And that's why he wants us to live together because it's hard. It specifically is hard. When you, you know, when you work with a bunch of people or you have people you live with in your house, you know, their, their little habits and their personalities can start to grate on you and you can start to become frustrated with them. Well, that's part of the process of us learning patience and learning how to love. Because fellowship and brotherly love are not optional. Christ commands them. Just like God commanded the children of Israel to invite strangers in and celebrate the, the Sukkot with them, uh, we have the same kind of commandment. This uh, principle of kind of reaching out to each other and, and inviting them in and being part of that, God wants us to not only love our friends, but He wants us to love our neighbors and even our enemies. So worship is, is sweet when it's done together. And that's how God wants us to do it. So I'm hoping that someone else answers the phone. Yeah. One minute. Sorry about that. All right, so number three. Third lesson is we're just passing through. Uh, I think the verse I want to look at here is Matthew 18. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, let's take a look at Matthew 18. I've forgotten the, the section I want to read here, but maybe it'll come up my notes. But this idea of us just passing through is kind of central to the teaching, and and it's related to uh, the idea of the kingdom, that uh, you know God has planned something much better for mankind than what we currently experience. Over and over and over, God makes clear to us in the Bible that this world is not our home. Our goal and our destination is God's kingdom, and you know to to become too comfortable with this world is to lose sight of the world to come, of the kingdom to come. And that's, uh, that's what the idea of these tabernacles, of these booths, that's what they represent. You know, to kind of look around you and realize that all this is just, you know, flimsy. It's just this, this little construction um, that you need to see the stars, you know, through the roof, that it's not permanent. Uh, God tells us to be like little children. And it's better, uh, oh yeah, that's the verse there. Mm. Yeah, right in the, right in the beginning. Um, he calls a child in verse, two, in verse 2, and he says, Unless you turn to become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receive, receives one such child in my name receives me. So, the... Um, God tells us that to enter that kingdom, we have to be like little children. And it's better to enter life maimed than to be thrown into, uh, into the fire and not be in the kingdom. The implication is that we are not truly living uh, in this world. We're just, um, this is like a, a test. You know, this is a, a trial period for us to learn the experiences that are going to happen to us in the kingdom. Uh in the next chapter, chapter uh, 19, Jesus tells the rich young ruler to go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. So it, it has not, doesn't have anything to do with the possessions and the things we have now. It has to do with what we do with the life that we have now, and that's what blesses us with the life to come. Um, 
Yeah, in, uh, in that chapter 18, he talks about it's better to you know, cut off a hand or pluck out an eye than to not be able to be in the kingdom. That's how important it was to Jesus. So the kingdom is, is uh, of greatest value to us. And nothing in this world, our possessions or our family, even our, our life or limb, is worth as much as the kingdom. So God's commandment to the children of Israel was to live in these booths for one week as a reminder of how transient our life is. He wanted them to know they were just passing through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. And the, that, that idea comes clearly through to us, too. That we're, we have to remind ourselves that we're just passing through this world on our way to the kingdom period. We tend to get you know, too hap happy. We start thinking that this world is permanent, that this world is what it's all about. So those are the, the three things that I, I get out of this point, and I hope uh, those things kind of resonate with you as well, that you know, forgiveness requires us to be thankful. Uh, we have to worship together in order to please God, and that this world is, is not permanent. This world is transit. We're just passing through. So like a, a Jew who, who had to sleep and eat in this fragile, temporary, little shaky, you know, wooden tent, for a week, the point is driven home that this is not our final destination. We're only passing through, heading for the promised land. We're exchanging our life, our fortune, for the kingdom to come. Choosing instead to be a part of the family of Christ. Who are, who are Jesus' family members? Those who do the will of his Father. And what is his will? To love God and love your neighbor. That's, that's the message. It's quite simple. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but it's a matter of giving thanks, of fellowship, of giving up all that we have in order to gain that which is truly permanent. So it's uh, the, the suck-off is uh, temporary to help us appreciate what really is permanent in our life. And that's sometimes encouraging, too, when, you, when you're having a bad day, to realize that, this is just temporary. These things will pass. That we're really waiting for the permanent thing to come in the future. Good. That's all the lessons I have. If anyone has any uh, any thoughts or questions they want to share, now's a good time. So, Jeff, what is the um, if the uh, I don't know in the booths there. Peter yeah, I can't hear you. Okay. I don't know what you're saying. Okay. In the Transfiguration, Peter wanted to make booths. Does that have anything to do with this? Oh, right. Yeah, those the booths of Transfiguration. The same same booth. Same same concept. He wanted to he wanted to spend let's let's build a booth. Let's spend a week here and celebrate. And fellowship, and it was like you know, no, this is just a glimpse of what's going to be coming in the future. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know where the reference is? The Transfiguration. Matthew. The Matthew. The Transfiguration of Matthew. Oh yeah, it's in a couple of different places. Oh, I'll get it real quick for you. Uh, Matthew seventeen and Luke. Chapter 9. When you say booth, you don't mean like a telephone booth, do you? Now, they were very small, though. You know, you um, basically just, just the size of like a sleeping bag. You know, very small. So, you know, it's a... Uh, for me, this was, you know, the reason I did this study is I just kind of, I, you know, I'd heard about these things all my life. I, I worked with Jewish people, and they, they talked about the you know, the different holy days, and I didn't know know much about it. And uh, I find it interesting that God, in, in designing these uh, these uh, feasts, you know, even then, even at these Jewish feasts, he gives us a picture of Jesus, and we can see 
uh, the salvation of Christ in these same things. Let's uh, say a prayer. Thank you. Great God, we're very thankful for these uh, few weeks we've had to look at this topic, uh, something we don't think about very much, something that's not a big part of our lives, um, but it's helpful for us to see these lessons and to uh, learn more about our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. We, we thank you for blessing us with this time together, and we, I ask that you would uh, be with all those who are there in uh, Illinois tonight, that you would uh, bless them and help them to continue to study, continue to learn more about uh, your plan for each one of them. I, we thank you for this, and we praise your name in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. All right, everyone. For, you bet. For good your, to talk to you again. Yep, good for the...